Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Tom Blinkhorn. I'm with Osher at Dartmouth, and it's a delight to uh, have, well, all the Bradleys are here, most of them. I mean, from, from, from France, from uh, the Boston area, from White River Junction. I mean, they're all, I mean, they're all here. And we're delighted to have the Bradleys here. Uh, I have uh, asked uh, the distinguished classics professor from Dartmouth, uh, Edward Bradley, who's uh, to make the introduction here because he inspired this lecture and he happens to be the brother of Nick. So, Professor Bradley, you're on. For those of you who know Tom, know that uh, he is a master of the setup. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, uh, it is true that I twisted Tom's uh, <laughs> arm. I said, you have to invite my brother. Uh, uh, I, I just will be disconsolate and, and will not play tennis with you anymore unless you invite my brother. Uh, just not. But that much said, uh, it is uh, fa frankly thanks to uh, the ha very happy accident of Tom's having met Nick, and I, my youngest brother is referred to by his intimates as Nick although his name is Nicholas. Um, they met in Verona, Italy last June and discovered they had a lot in common in the field of music. Uh, jazz, uh, popular music, uh, uh, major figures in contemporary popular music, country music and so on. And when I uh, told Tom that Nick had also been uh, a, a writer whose uh, first novel had been just published, uh, Tom's uh, very enthusiastic uh, response was, let's get him here, let's get him here. I don't know if I imitate you well, but uh, it is in fact thanks to Tom's enthusiastic endorsement of uh, my youngest brother, who uh, in fact, thanks to Tom, I've come to discover as I never knew him before. Uh, <laughs> we are separated by several years in age, and I am, uh, uh, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm visibly older, but I am older than he. Uh, <laughs> He's visibly older. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's fair to say that when we were boys, um, I had, I wish to think, an affectionate regard for him and on him, but I never was terribly interested in him. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Nick. But <laughs> and so, you know, uh, he went his way, I went mine. I was out of the house and off to school when he was still at home. Uh, I knew that he had been a, quite a successful baseball pitcher. I knew that much about him, and I could do nothing athletically. Um, I knew that he'd studied piano, uh, uh, which I envied somewhat. Uh, but beyond that, I wasn't, I'd never paid too much attention to him. So it is only, frankly, within the last uh, several years, and even as recently as yesterday when I was driving him home from the Manchester airport and was able to trace his biography a little more precisely than I had known it before, that I came to the fullness of the discovery of a remarkable man, and believe it or not, a man whom I have come to be sure, I've never stopped loving him, I think, but whom I've come to admire immensely. Uh, for what he's achieved in his own life, which has not been altogether easy, in part because of some unhappy choices he may have made, in part because of circumstances that were not uh, within his own control. Um, uh, as we agreed in the car yesterday, uh, his life, is, his career has been checkered, uh, <laughs> immensely checkered. Um, uh, it's known uh, some detours here and there. He thought he was a candidate for veterinary medicine at the University of Michigan State, which apparently is the place to go if one is interested in veterinary medicine. And he explained to me that he flunked every course, every course, with the exception, friends, of a course, believe it or not, in hockey. He got an A in hockey because he actually was a fairly good hockey goalie. goalie. 
So he, he didn't flunk out that first semester, but he was given advice to turn to the humanities. And in some ways, the rest is history. And as he went forth, he also pursued his music and uh, became a professionally trained classical jazz musician. And it was that that led him to California to seek fame and fortune in the world of Los Angeles. And it's, uh, it uh, became clear, I think, fairly soon that uh, there was neither fame nor fortune to be found, despite the fact that he was rather a rather good classical jazz pianist. But during that time, he became a writer. Uh, and my sense is that he's always been a writer in one way or another, and then a serious writer, even as he was a committed a pianist. Um, he wrote, and he also then, uh, as, as a result of going back to school and getting a degree in English, he became a teacher. He taught and he agreed to teach in schools in Los Angeles that were, so far as I can determine from what he's told me, pretty much defined as dead end places. Uh, certainly dead ends for anyone professionally interested in, in uh, public teaching in Los Angeles County. And certainly dead ends for the students who attended these schools, most of whom came from communities that consisted of uh, immigrants from uh, uh, Mexico uh, and uh, principally from Mexico and other Latin and Central, America. and Central America as well. So he has devoted himself to that world uh, without acquiring fame or fortune, but he found in that world the energy to take an event that is a true event and, and transform it creatively into a painful and poignant and I think powerful novel. Uh, uh, I, I say that without shame. I think it's a terrific book. I, 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 when I read it, I couldn't quite believe that my own youngest brother had written it, but I really think it's very good. And the topic obviously is one that is of immense moment for all of us now uh, in uh, the current politics in America where so much is hanging on the, the uh, I, it's hard for me to use the word president, but uh, the person, <laughs> person in the White House who changes his mind almost daily on what determination to make uh, with regard to the people called dreamers and other immigrant populations that have brought so much to this nation. So without further ado, it is truly with great pride, and may I say a great honor, to introduce to you my brother, Nicholas Bradley. I, I think I'll keep him as a brother. He's a good brother. He's, he, has, he has the good words. Used to, when I was younger, there wasn't this kind of love, but I didn't, there was more, more commands, more, I think you should do this and you will do this. Anyway, but thank you for having me come here and speak to you about my experiences. Um, uh, I'm going to violate what I know as a teacher. Um, as a teacher, I'm sure there are, there are teachers in the group here, you know if you teach secondary school or elementary school, you have about five minutes to deliver your lesson. And if you don't get that done in five minutes, you don't get it done. And the, you know you lost your audience. I'm going to speak longer than that. If your eyes start to glaze over, I, I, I will take that as a cue to stop. And, 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 and either you know, give you a break or don't. Uh, I, have, I had a lot of students uh, who, were, uh, who were incapable of sitting for an hour, and I can't blame them. The chairs were never that comfortable. And I would say, you may get up. Don't worry. You're not going to insult me if you get up and go stand in the back of the room. And it's OK with me. It doesn't bother me as long as you keep, you know, keep it to be, you don't in, interrupt your, your classmates and don't uh, uh, make, a, make a, you know, a, a mess of it. Uh, and so I, apply, I, give you, I give you the same right. If I get boring and you get starting to fall asleep in your chair, you may get up and move around. It doesn't bother me at all. Um, <clears throat> I can't, I can't really untangle the complexities of, of uh, immigration. I don't know that anybody really can. It's a, it is a complex issue. Um, uh, I can share with you my experiences as a teacher of a primarily poor immigrant population uh, for 30 years and why being their middle school, junior high and high school English ESL teacher, ESL English is a second language, um, uh, oftentimes felt like being on the last line of defense. That's what we sometimes characterize ourselves as being. There are more than two million undocumented 
<coughs> immigrants in California and LA County, uh, where approximately one in 10 is undocumented, has the largest share. So think about that, one in 10. In about one in three at the middle school where I started teaching was undocumented. So had Prop 187 passed in California back in 1994, it did pass, it's just been tied up in the courts ever since, um, we would have lost, in the school that I was teaching, we would have lost one third of our population. They would have all been deported. Fortunately, it didn't pass. In uh, 2016, approximately 800,000 crossed the border without documents. Half of those were turned back. And those numbers, of course, are, you know, they're, they're, they're speculative. In December of 2015 alone, 10,000, over 10,000 unaccompanied young people crossed the border from Mexico. Those numbers scare people and make them think that we are under siege. From 1984 to, 90, to 2014, I taught English and ESL in secondary schools in the East San Fernando Valley. Some, anyone here know Los Angeles? A little bit, yeah but the west side of Los Angeles. This is the east side of San Fernando Valley. <clears throat> I taught in a primarily poor immigrant population in two schools, a junior high school that became a middle school in the mid-90s and a high school that took half of that culminating class from that school. In other words, for 30 years, I taught the same basically population. The two schools were within, throw a rock and you hit one, basically a few miles from one another. And so I taught the same population for 30 years. And so there was never a time when there wasn't somebody's cousin or brother or sister that I, hadn't, I, had, I had taught their brother or, or brothers or sisters. Or, uh, my, my record was 11 members in one family. I taught, uh, I taught the mother and the daughter, the mother and the son. And in two cases, I taught the grandmother, the daughter, and the, and, the grandson, and the grandchild. Now you gotta figure the math on that. Okay, the arithmetic. <laughs> I attended quinceañeras, weddings, and heartbreaking funerals. Celebrated the arrival of beautiful babies, attended birthday parties and football and basketball and baseball games and track meets. I had classes sometimes as small as 23. That was my smallest class sometimes as large as 55. Now remember, I'm an English teacher, and I have five of those classes. Now think about that. If you're an English teacher, and if you're doing your job, you're assigning essays. Oh, dear Lord. Okay, <laughs> just I want you to think about that. That's over 200 essays you've got to read, the student writing. <clears throat> uh, with, uh, oftentimes, those larger classes, the, the kids sat on windowsills because there weren't enough chairs, and you couldn't fit the chairs in the room if you, if you had them. Uh, most years I taught five periods a day, and some years I taught six the whole day. Uh, a few years I taught one class a day. Those were, those were very nice years because I was the federal Title I program coordinator. Title I was a, was a part of uh, No Child Left Behind. And it, it, provided, it, it provided money for the schools and needed to, have a federal, it had, needed to have a coordinator pay attention to that, what was happening to that money. I want to state at the outset that no matter that I taught and lived in the same area for 30 years, the area of my students and my school, I, I'm, I will always be and always was an outsider looking in. There's only so much I can know as, as an outsider. It's not, I don't have any kind of real, real uh, depthful knowledge. I only was allowed in so far and, you know, because of cultural differences. And, but I hope that my 30 years of experience as a teacher in schools largely populated by the children of the poor immigrant families will tell us something about policies and expectations and attitudes toward the immigrant students and the immigrant population at large. Here are some facts about LA Unified. Now these are hard to comprehend. <laughs> in the sec it is the second largest uh, school district in the country. It has 734,000 students last year. 734,000 students. When I started in the mid 80s, I think it was closer to 775,000. Now think about that, the children. <laughs> A lot of kids. Um, there are over, 20, uh, over 26,000 teachers, over 33,000 other employees, and uh, about over 1,100 schools in the district. Mm -hmm. The ethnic breakdown is 72% Latino, 10% white, 9.6% African American, 4% Asian American, 
And in 2008, there were 6,400 Armenian students, 3,300 3, of them in the East San Fernando Valley student. Uh, Los Angeles has become a center for Armenian uh, uh, resettlement. Uh, Glendale, California particularly, and Glendale is close enough to North Hollywood where I was teaching that a lot of the spillover, they, they came to those schools as well. I began teaching in February of 1984 at Sun Valley Junior High School, just 10 years, and what you're looking at in these pictures as, I, as we flip through them, <clears throat> whatever I do with the clicker, this is all Sun Valley. This is all Sun Valley, so you see the kind of the irony of the name, Sun Valley. This is not Sun Valley, Idaho, where people ski. This is, this is, this is Sun Valley, uh, California. Uh, just 10 years before, the school had been attended by a primarily middle-class white population that came from the nearby ranches. Ten years later, the local white population had moved on and their children went to private schools and magnet schools and the student population of Sun Valley Junior High grew to be primarily poor and Latino. The area of Sun Valley, Van Nuys, North Hollywood, Silmar, and Pacoima had become the new port of entry for immigrants from Mexico, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Here were the problems. The immigrant population was growing dramatically. The school population was growing by leaps and bounds. The newcomers were poor, and oftentimes the incoming students arrived never having been in school. Now we're talking about, I only taught 7 through 12. So we're talking about kids who came into the school district, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, who had never been in a classroom, but they had to be placed in, a high, they couldn't go to, back to kindergarten, they were too old, obviously, they couldn't go back to elementary school, so they had to start where they were age-wise, but in terms of schooling, they were, some of them had had no schooling whatsoever. The veteran teachers, the ones who had taught the previous students, had great difficulty adapting to the new student group. Many of them resented this new, darker group, complained at their tables in the lunchroom or in the parking lot after school, wearied by the amount of energy the students required these kids, they'd say. They don't do their homework, they don't bring their supplies, they fool around, they're rude, they don't listen, they don't get it. The old guard teachers longed for the students they used to have, the ones whose greatest sin was to chew gum in class. This was a different population. The school was not prepared for these students, the majority of whom did not speak English as a first language and did not speak, to, and did not speak, a, uh, speak it as a home language. The majority of teachers were white commuters from other parts of LA. The materials in the book room were outdated and inaccessible to students who were barely literate in their first language and in many cases illiterate in English. The white students in the 1970s used the scholastic units uh, in their English classrooms, the courage unit and the responsibility unit, to name a couple, with classroom sets of uh, paperbacks like Contiki, remember Contiki? And God is my co-pilot, uh, to go along with them. By the mid-80s, those paperbacks were shredded and the unit binders lost or destroyed. The only book left was an even older one of the heft of the Bible. With illustration, with uh, print dense on the page, virtually no white space, no illustrations, and with stories and articles of no interest or relevance to the current students. The condition of these books reminded me of the books that black, black school children were given in their separate but equal classrooms in the Jim Crow South. They weren't, there weren't enough of them anyway that weren't torn or heavily adorned with graffiti. When I asked the department chairperson for a classroom set, she said, we don't have them. He said, what we do get, though, is a classroom set of Reader's Digest each month. So you might want to ask Mrs. Miss Cook to, for a class set. And so as I began teaching, that's what I began teaching with, a class set of Reader's Digest. Did the principal know? She must have. Did she do anything about it? Not until she was forced to. Did the district know? I don't know. No one checked. It felt as though the attitude up and down the line was, why waste the money or effort on these kids? They barely know English. Make purple mimeograph copies of workbook pages and keep them quiet. You remember the mimeograph machines? Remember that purple ink? Yeah, you remember that? Okay, I know, yeah, all right. <laughs> I began as an emergency credential teacher, which meant that I had a BA in English, but I had taken no education classes at the university, nor had I any experience in the classroom, no student teaching, there were no mentor teachers, no one really to help. The same Mrs. Cook was assigned as my buddy teacher, and she visited my classroom once, and told me after only two months on the job, with no experience, no materials, no support, that I needed classroom management. <laughs> really? <laughs> me. 
I taught at Sun Valley Middle School, junior high school and middle school for 18 years. I loved that school. It didn't take long to realize that in so many ways and by so many people, some of them colleagues, the immigrant poor were discounted. Why are you worrying about these kids? The best they're going to do is get a menial job somewhere or work in McDonald's. Over that 18 year period, the administrative staff and much of the teaching staff came and went as though through swinging doors. The school became a repository for administrators, administrators and teachers who had washed out elsewhere. Send them to a place where they can do the least harm. Many washed out at Sun Valley as well and were moved on to become a burden somewhere else. Sun Valley Middle School was one of the poorest in the city, but no help arrived from the district. Achievement, test scores, and behavior were abysmal. When school officials did eventually show up, it was with a lot of finger pointing and blame. And you can see this is all. The school is half a mile from these, this, this area right here. The school is right in, in this area. So what, what you're seeing here is the, the kind of the environment that the kids come from, that, that they walk through, that they know. And uh, yeah. At North Hollywood High School where I transferred in 2002, so I left Sun Valley after 18 years and went to, I went to a high school that was, that, that was fed by this school and another one, and taught for there for the next 12 years. Many students read at the third and fourth grade levels. I had classes of kids who were reading them. These are kids who are 14, 15, 16 years old, 17 years old, who read at the third and fourth grade level. Many struggled with algebra. Test scores were terrible. Neither school could meet the state, Cal state of California benchmarks. But other than administrators and high-ranking personnel downtown lamenting the fact not enough was done about it. Follow-through and follow-up simply weren't existent. After all, who was going to complain? Not the parents. Too many of them were undocumented and didn't want to come up on the radar. I'm not going to say anything. I don't want anybody paying attention to what I'm doing. Others of them were too embarrassed to say anything because they didn't have any command of English. So they wouldn't come to back to school night um, because they were too embarrassed by the fact they didn't have enough English. So there was not much participation of the parents in the, in the, in the operation or the even knowledgeable about the school, about what was going on in the school. They trusted the teachers to do what they needed to do. And, and yeah, <laughs> sometimes that happened and sometimes that didn't. Here are some of the other things you might have to live with if you were a kid in this, in, this, in this time. Sometimes you have no expectations or dreams for the future, only fear. Like the main character in my book, Ricky Trujillo, you don't believe you have reason to expect anything different than what you know, and what you know is provided solely by this neighborhood. Sometimes you, the daughter, have to stay home to babysit younger siblings because there is no father and the mother needs to work. Or you, son or daughter, have to stay home to take someone to the clinic because you know how to drive, even though you may in fact be too young to have a license. And so when I was in middle school, every now and again one of my eighth graders would say, Mr. Bradley, I saw you driving out in the street. And I said, what were you doing? Oh, I was driving my mom to the clinic. And I said, you're not old enough to drive your mom to the clinic. Didn't make any difference. And you know, they, that's what they did. They, if they learned how to drive, they... They, they were sometimes called to do that. Sometimes you had to quit school because your father is gone and you need a job. Sometimes two or three families have to share a small house together. Sometimes you and your family have to live in a garage. Sometimes you can't afford the school supplies the teacher asks for. You can't get work done because there's no space other than the bathroom and with the TV blaring there's no quiet. And you can't check a book out at the library because you borrowed a book when you were in elementary school and you, didn't, you lost it and didn't pay for it in the library you remembers. By the mid-90s, enrollment in public schools had grown so high that most of the Los Angeles schools were put on tracks. Students were assigned A, B, C, or God forbid, D track. The schools, some, some built in the 1920s, were built for a certain number of students, and now they had to accommodate twice, three times as so many. North Hollywood High School was built for 1,200 students back in 1927. By the time in the mid-90s and by the time in the early 2000s, we had 4,500 students in that school. 4,500 students for a school that was supposed to house 1,200 maximum. <laughs> So they broke the school into tracks. So we were a three-track school, A, B, and C. So two tracks were on at any given time. B track was the darkest track. No one wanted, there were no advanced placement, no advanced placement classes on B track, and no one wanted to teach it, and no one wanted to be on it. Because here's how it went. You were on for eight weeks. You began, this, you began the year July 5th. You were on for eight weeks. 
then you're off for eight weeks. Then you're back on for eight weeks. Then you're off for eight weeks. Then you're back on for eight weeks. Continuity? No. He didn't go to school because the other two tracks were on school. That's how they, that's how they handled the, the explosive, ex exploding population. Regardless of all that worked against the success of our students, dedicated colleagues found one another at both schools and refused to give up on the students. And though many kids had been told along the way by a burnt out teacher or an exhausted parent that they couldn't succeed or that they, had, they should quit and go to work, Though they were way behind, they worked hard to overcome their deficits, and we and they began to hope and to see possibility. We saw ourselves as being the last line of defense. If our eighth graders fell into that crevasse between eighth and ninth grade, couldn't make the transition between eighth and ninth, somehow disappeared, we knew we had lost them. It wasn't gonna, we weren't going to get them back. Or if they dropped out and didn't graduate from high school, then we feared we had lost them to the streets. We knew they had to stay in school, so we devoted hours after school and on Saturdays to try to catch them up. We recognized and applauded the tenacity, the courage, and the determination of many. If they were going to expend that energy, if they were going to have that hope, we were too. Who else would catch them if they fell? To whom else would they turn? There, there wasn't any magic. It was just that we and they continued to show up. Quietly, our students began to succeed. When the high school graduates come back, like Daisy does in my book, she comes, when they, they're like Daisy. They're, they're, all Daisy says to her brother is, I work and I go to school. I go to school and I work, and that's what they do. Not gangbanging, not tagging, not partying, not living off the state. They're working and going to school, paying taxes and making something of themselves, living at home and living frugally, helping out at home, working and going to school, supported by our belief in them. So lots of, lot, almost all the kids that we see who come back after, after a year gone from high school, that's what they're doing, working and going to school, taking classes at the local community college or Cal State Northridge somewhere, but working and going to school. In ret retrospect, we weren't, the last, we weren't the, the last line of defense. We were more like those people who line the streets and they're in a marathon and hand out water and juice to the marathoners, <clears throat> cheering them on as they head for the finish line, knowing the importance of staying in the race and finishing. At the same time, I don't want you to, I don't want to sugarcoat the experience or be Pollyanna about it. The schools were in a poor neighborhood, and that neighborhood <laughs> had all the negative features of poverty, gangs, drugs, domestic violence, gang violence, graffiti, scarcity of good jobs, <clears throat> and lack of resources. It was unsafe during many times of the day. The school, to a certain degree, was a safe haven though it was often tagged by rival gangs, and we certainly had a number of fights on campus. But the worst violence happened off campus. The gangs had declared the schools as sort of a free zone, and most of the time the peace was kept. Every year we lost a number of students to the streets, sometimes merely as dropouts, but sometimes worse. One of my students was shot and killed at a stoplight, coming home from work because he probably gave the wrong answer to the question, where are you from? Another boy was killed because he had crossed someone out. We lost five boys in one family, either killed or imprisoned. The basic events in this book, Ricky Trujillo, are in fact factual. This is my novel right here. This is Ricky Trujillo. And based on the life of a boy who was a student at both schools, the major events of this novel are drawn from real life. I didn't know him personally, he wasn't my student, but I had many students like him and I knew about him. His story haunted me for a number of years before I wrote the book about him. In the book, he's a troubled high school student who was also a talented baseball player. In actuality, he was the boy that this is based on. <clears throat> many people think baseball could have been his way out. He had that kind of skill. He would go to a local, they had it mapped out. They, uh, I've heard the coaches now in high school talk about that. They're, okay, so this is what he does. He goes here to junior college for a couple of years. They hold on to him, get him some support uh, scholastically, and also get him build up his skills as a, a whatever sport he happens to play. And then we, then we get him placed at some place, a good baseball place like Riverside or Arizona or ASU or Texas or one of the good baseball schools. 
and that's what they do with their football players and their, their basketball players and their baseball players. They kind of kind of see them along, and that's what they thought they were going to do with this boy. <clears throat> he lives with his grandmother. He has an older brother and a sister, <clears throat> and a father and a mother who are out of the picture, but his father has just shown up after many years away and wants to take Ricky away from L.A. Ricky doesn't have any use for his father and doesn't want to go. This story takes place over the course of a weekend. In this excerpt that I'm going to read to you, Ricky and three members of his tagging crew are eating outside at a little rundown Mexican restaurant on Saturday afternoon inspired by... Can I find it? Let's see if I can find it. Uh, well, maybe we've already passed it. Well, where are you? This restaurant, inspired by this restaurant, which has been there for as long as I know this area. <clears throat> in this excerpt, Ricky and, his, and three members of his tag and crew are eating outside, outside at a little rundown Mexican restaurant on a Sunday afternoon after an unpleasant encounter with a store owner. After two of the boys leave, Ricky and his only close friend, Alex, reflect on the neighborhood. They are sitting outside on the concrete benches around a concrete table. I'm on page, if you have the book with you, it's on page 148. <clears throat> the last of the big chapter, the big uh, paragraph there. There's a little language here. I hope you won't be bothered by it. These are kids, after all. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dennis and, and and they actually used this word before our president did. I just want to tell you they they take precedence here. They have, and so, so when you hear the word, you'll know these kids had it before he did. Dennis finds a bottle cap and scribes his name in the stone. The rest of the day yawns emptily before them. No pool to swim in and too hot to do anything else. Dude, it's quiet on Sundays. Dennis says, not looking up from his work. What are those real noisy planes? Oscar asks. Private jets. Man, sometimes they scare the shit out of me. I think they're coming straight at me. You get used to it. I don't even hear them anymore, Alex says. Sometimes I'm in my house. It feels like the house is going to shake apart. The windows break everything, Dennis says. Imagine working there. Those guys must be deaf, dude. They wear earplugs or headphones, Ricky says. No one says anything for a minute. You are a phone? Dennis asks Ricky. No. Remember, Alex says to Ricky, we went to the airport on a field trip in elementary. What, third grade, Miss Fisher? They let us go on a plane and sit down for a moment and put on those big-ass headphones. You, could hardly, you couldn't hardly hear anything. That's right. You ever flown in a plane? Dennis asks Alex. No, i never been out of this place hardly, he says with, short, with a short sweep of his hand to me in the neighborhood, except for driving to TJ and one time going with my uncle and my mom and sisters all the way to my grandpa's place in Jalisco. That was cool, he says. And Ricky knows Alex is eager to tell him how much he wants to go there to live, that it's his life dream to go and work on his grandfather's ranch, but he holds up. It's too valuable to throw out into the hot, close air with the stinking cars going by. I never flown, Oscar says, anxious to be part of the conversation, but I've been to the beach. I've been to Santa Monica, Dennis says. Dude, you were on the same field trip to the airport, Ricky says to Dennis. Don't you remember? I was? I've been to Santa Monica too, dude, Oscar says. The water's dirty there. I thought I was going to get sick just from putting my feet in it. Me too, Dennis says. You swim? I can't swim. Me either. I wouldn't want to swim in that water anyway, Alex asks Ricky quietly. Remember that time me and you went? Yeah, I didn't like it much. Too much sky and water, getting out, going on forever. It made me feel sick or scared or something. It's cooler there. It's crazy, dude, Dennis says. We live like a little bit from there, and we never been, and we never go. We stay in this shithole and fry and listen to the planes going off to somewhere we'll never go. And those people over there at the beach enjoy all the cool air and the ocean breeze. That's sad, dude. Wait until my dad lets me take the car. I'm going every weekend, pick up girls and shit. He stops to think about that, and the others nod quietly in agreement. Oscar stands up. Where are you going, dude? Dennis asks. I don't know. My house, I guess. I can't stand it when it gets hot. I'm going to, I'm going to call Patty. She's got a pool. You want to go over her house? Yeah, Dennis says. Alex watches Ricky to see what his response will be. Maybe, he says. Call me if she says it's OK. Me too, Alex says. I'm coming with you, dude, Dennis says as he gets up from the table and throws the bottle cap into the trash can by the side of the building. He raises his arm in celebration when it goes in. Two points! After they've gone, Ricky and Alex sit without speaking for a while. That guy's an asshole, Ricky says finally. Who? That guy at the music store. Oscar, my old man. They all piss me off. 
Alex says nothing. They both look around and take in the immediate surroundings, the overflowing cat trash can at the sidewalk, the walls of the restaurant gray from car exhaust, the marred tables and benches, dark splotches of gum ground into the concrete, plastic ketchup cap packages on the ground with squirts of ketchup hardening on the sun and packs of flies buzzing around, the pawn shop and the secondhand store, the pupasaria and the old movie theater across and down the street turned into some kind of crazy church. This place, dude. What? Look at it. Damn, I feel like I'm finally seeing it. I want to get my mom and sisters out of here. It makes me sick. He pauses for a moment. It scares me, dude, like it's going to hold on to me and not let me go. Do you know what I mean? You don't want to get out of here, get out of this? He asks Ricky quietly. No, I don't know. A smoking car putters down the wide boulevard. I'd go in a heartbeat if I could get my mom to move back to Mexico. I want to get out of here, ride horses, help my grandpa on his ranch. When's the last time you've been to Mexico, he asks. I've never been. My grandma has a sister there. She, he gets up. Alex carries the trash to the barrel next to the restaurant wall. They walk to the end of the block and across the boulevard back into their neighborhood. The people there made fun of my Spanish, laughed when I said things and asked me to repeat them. That sucked, Alex says. Milk mailboxes that tilt back or lean on bent pipes toward the street are hand-lettered in black paint that dripped and ran. Faded newspapers, hardened black dog shit, paper cups, broken glass at the curbs, curtainless windows, houses painted so long ago the paint turned to powder and blew away, leaving gray board or naked cinder block to the relentless sun and wind, but most of all the dirt, the barren, hard-packed dirt of backyards under shade trees, the pebbly dirt of the baseball diamond, the fine choking sand carried by the Santa Ana winds that sneaks in beneath sashes and past louvers and coats, window sills and dressers, and anything left untouched or unmoved for a few days, that's what Nuki knows. That what he has come to expect and, and accept as the real world. Everything else is a fantasy or an unfilled promise. Even if he were to leave it physically, he fears he will end up in a place that looks just like this. Or even if it doesn't, <clears throat> even if his father isn't lying and where he lives the air is clear and the sun bright and the streets clean, Ricky fears that he carries some contagion, some alien seed that will infect the new place and turn it into this place. He can't leave. What if he finds his vision of people and places to be true? It's better to stay Day. Better not to know for certain. Certain. See ya, Alex says as he turns off on his block. I'll call you if I'm going over Patty's. It's going to be too hot. <clears throat> okay. Here are some, some quotes for you. I just, they, they struck me as being maybe may be important. It is certain in any case that ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. James Baldwin. Where justice is denied, where poverty is enforced, where ignorance prevails, and where any class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither persons nor property will be safe. That's Frederick Douglass. <clears throat> When we generalize, when we, know, when we fail to know or choose not to know individuals, we can be easily led down the path of thoughtless and cruel decision-making and racism. This is Edris's story. Edris is an 11th grader at North Hollywood High School. Edris's father was going to work on Friday morning this past June. He drove out of the parking lot of his apartment building and was detained by ICE. That's the Immigration and Customs Enforcement people. The man had no outstanding warrants or any legal issues. They took his keys, drove his truck back into the parking lot, left the keys inside, and locked it. They took Edris's father into custody. This was Friday. On Sunday, the family received a call. The man had died of a heart attack. <clears throat> the family was obviously shocked. The father was in his mid-40s and in good health and a good man. The family had an autopsy performed and were advised by an attorney to file suit. In the meantime, there was the issue of income. The father had been the main provider. Edris's mother made a little money uh, caring for an older woman, but was not enough to pay for the apartment rent of $1,200 a month. So by the seemingly cavalier and unwarranted act on the part of ICE, a family was tossed into financial chaos. The father died during the last week of school. When school resumed in August, Edris tried to attend, but he was working as many hours as he could as a dishwasher in a restaurant and was basically on call when they needed him. He failed four classes because he was almost never in class. 
Ruby Castillo, uh, she's one of the people I modeled the character Ruby Lopez after in the book, heard about the boy and filed an incident report thinking that the action would open the door for help for Edris. None was forthcoming. The boy's guidance counselor, the pupil services and attendance counselor, and the district's A through G counselor were, had no help for the boy. The most that they could do was to move him to a continuation school where he could work at his own pace academically. He began there this, this month at the continuation school. This is a case of a delicate balance being destroyed thoughtlessly. Who knows how this family of mother, daughter, and son will survive? Who will be there to help? Anyone. Or will Edris, Edris be the target of the self-righteous and simple-minded who will point to him as a lazy and shiftless high school dropout who is a drain on the American first economy? And now, besides the 800,000 DACA, of people. We have 262,000 more people with their livelihoods and their, their lives in jeopardy, the TPS people, the people from El Salvador, the temporary protected status people, being shipped back to El Salvador after decades in this country. The damage will be devastating to those families, as you probably already know. We have managed to find a way to be, they found a way to be, met, to be productive citizens in this country. These are people who miraculously, and I think heroically, survived and continue to survive incredible hardship and overcame and continue to overcome numerous obstacles to maintain the delicate balance between survival and disaster who, like most of the families of the children I taught, perform a high-wire act each day in order to keep a roof over their heads and food on their table and children in school. Jackie Escobar was a student of mine almost 30 years ago. She's very active in the LDS church in, in Massachusetts. Her family is from El Salvador. Here is part of Jackie's Facebook post from last week. Yesterday was just a sad day and listening to so many stories of people who have been here for decades and now feel that their life is going to change. A family in our ward is already planning on moving because they don't ever want to be found by ICE. I keep having feelings of survivor's guilt because when I was young and undocumented, I never had to face the fear and anxiety of being deported. Between all of these TPS cancellations and DACA being up in the air, our families are so afraid and stressed. Despite my, despite my country being in such a chaos, and she's talking about El Salvador now, despite my country being in such a state of chaos, violence, conflict, etc., not for one minute do I appreciate it between being referred to as an s-hole of a place. These are my people. This is where I am from, and I will never tolerate such disgusting rhetoric. I'm going to finish now with a student named Raul Rios. For years, all California high school students had to take something called the high school exit exam. You couldn't exit high school if you hadn't passed this high school exit exam. They start taking it in 10th grade. They can take it, in, uh, they take it I think, once or twice in 10th. Take it two or three times more in 11th. Take it about four or five times in 12th. They got to get these guys out here. And you couldn't get a, you couldn't get a diploma until you, had, you had, had passed it. And surprisingly, many students struggled with it. And it really, it really wasn't that difficult, but it, but it was for kids who were not reading it and not, and not functioning at grade level. Raul Rios was one. Raul was not one of my students, but he had heard that I tutored English after school most days. So with bulldog determination, he came to my Title I, Title I office every day of the second semester for an hour after class, and we worked on the exit exam material. He had already failed the English portion in the fall and all the preceding times in 10th and 11th grades. It was just Raul and his mom scraping along, but she loves her boy, and, he's, and he loves her. She has done a good job with him. He's a big boy with a pleasant, self-effacing manner, quiet and light with a shy sense of humor. He would be the one to sit up close to the teacher to try to get the difficult stuff, but easily passed over because he is so quiet. We laughed and talked and worked through the exit exam study guides. He took the exam in February. The results came at the end of March, and he didn't pass. We soldiered on. He took the exam again in April. If he didn't pass this time, he would not be able to graduate with his class. The end of May arrived, uh, end of May arrived and the results came in. Raul had finally passed. I think by one point. I think it was one or two points. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. He came to my office and shook my hand and hugged me. I passed, he said, astonished by that fact. His mother came and was effusive in her gratitude, but she and I both knew that Raul's determination had done the trick. Fast forward but a little more than a year, and I'm, going, I'm coming back from a movie in North Hollywood, and I'm walking to the head, I'm headed for the parking lot, and I can hear my name. Someone called, Mr. Bradley! I turn around, and it's Raul. I haven't seen him since a tearful graduation evening. After a happy exchange of how have you been and what have you been doing and is everything the same at NH, he tells me, Mr. Bradley, guess what? 
I'm going to Valley, Valley College, starting my second year. I don't know what I'm going to major in, but I'm transferring to CSUN next year. Oh, and my mom says hi. We got you something long time ago. I'm telling her to bring it tomorrow. I'll tell her to bring it tomorrow, the next day. I, who thought that Raul had hit the pinnacle of his educational journey by passing the high school exit exam, was speechless. Oh, and I've got good grades. I passed English 028, all because of you. That, of course, is not true, but I have the presence of mind to just say thank you. The next day, there's a knock on my office door, and it's Raul's mom. She has something in a cardboard box. Raul wanted you to have this. He said, you needed it. I don't know why. <laughs> my experience tells me that the vast majority of immigrants come here for a better life. It would seem that measured language and measured tone and the compassion implied in the poem scribed in the Statue of Liberty might be good starting points to solving the problem of immigration. The answers are within us, the people. Sensible solutions don't seem to be coming from the leaders we have at this point. So our job is to demand that they recognize the complexity and the enormity of the problem without falling back on simplistic and racist answers. In the meantime, I'll worry about Raul, the Raouls of this world and the boys like Edris and Ricky, hoping to be able to keep them in the race. I don't wear this hat often, because it keeps on blowing off. I don't, I don't know why. It doesn't seem to, <laughs> but I keep it in sight, a reminder of the obstacles to overcome and the success that is possible. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I've enjoyed being here. Thank you so much. for a break and uh, take a look at the books. Uh, Nick will be up there. I will be out there. Sign them if yeah, you wish. I will. And um, and then we'll come back. I'll give you a shout in uh, about 10, no more than 15 minutes. So we're there? ready for comments, questions, whatever is on your mind. I'll explain what this is. Yeah, uh, Nick is going to start by explaining what this is. These are all, these all, all these black and white slides are of, are of the uh, Sun Valley. This is a contemporary Sun Valley. Um, the school is about a quarter of a mile away from this, so this is really kind of in the heart of the area. And this is the church. If you, when you read the book, uh, you'll see that this this church plays this what, what used to be what used to be a movie theater, and now has uh, become a it become an evangelical church. And I, it may have folded up by this time too. What I find ironic, my son and I, we couldn't. He, I asked my son to take these pictures, and he didn't get a chance to take a picture of this church. So we went on the internet and found the church. And you see up, the uh, up on the left-hand side, completely by chance, the name of Valentin Trujillo. I was like, what? <laughs> it's like I asked them to put the name Trujillo up there. I didn't. And then I wanted to show you, I want to show you these. So then I've got, you know, over 30 years, you know, middle school and high school kids love pictures of themselves. These girls are either going to a quinceanera, which we would call Sweet 16, or they're, maybe they're going to the prom, or they're going to, I don't know what, some of my students. These are my hardcore girls. This is the big hair days. This was, uh, this was in the 1980s, early, early 90s. And, and these girls were fighters. There was nothing there. You didn't want to mess with these girls at all. And I, I always told the student, the student teachers, I said, boy fights, you can break up on your own. A girl fight, you have to have a companion to break up because you're going to end up with fingernails in your, in your eyes. And if you've got any hair to grab, you're going to get your hair grabbed. So I said, don't try to break up a girl fight on your own. And these girls, uh, they were tough girls. I loved them, but they were tough. They would come have lunch with me because they knew that if they, uh, I and a couple of other people would open our classrooms at lunchtime because a lot of kids needed to get away from kind of the public you know, being out in, among the other kids because they knew they were going to get in fights, and so they had. And then, and this was this was a time <clears throat> when a lot of when a lot of uh, the gangs in the late 80s and 90s were a lot of time with the poverty in the uh, in the in the area. There was a lot of fighting, a lot of, and the girl gangs began. These girls are probably members of what was called violent girls. Not all of them, but some of them were. And these some of the boys. <laughs> Sweet kids. What grade would that be, Nick? Uh, 
That would be maybe eight, eighth or ninth. And then this, this little girl is either going to, has, again, going to a quinceanera, has come from a quinceanera. A quinceanera is basically kind of, it's like a, it's like a coming out. It's like, it's like a mini wedding. They, the, 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 I mean, it's, they, they, can be, they can cost a fortune. They're not the same thing in Mexico. In Mexico, they are basically a church service. This is a church service plus, and the girls, you can see them, the, 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 you know, they have the padrinos and the madrinos, everybody contributes to it, and the guy, everybody has to wear dresses and you know, dress up, and the boys, and it's like, a, it's like a mini wedding. It's like, you know, I'm getting my daughter ready, and I take a look at her, is she marriageable? Is she, have, you know, I don't, I don't know quite, I don't, again, that's the outsider in me looking in. I really don't understand quite what that's all about, anyways. <laughs> there she is. She's all dressed up. She you looks cool. Yeah, you know? she was my student. Yeah. She was your student. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Bradley, take a picture of me. Take a picture of me. <laughs> okay. So we took pictures. Yes, sir. Do I need the mic? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Uh, there may be a, a very long term solution. Uh, and I'd like to explore it uh, here. First of all, the problem is not confined to just students of, of immigrant families. Uh, education in this country uh, in the lower echelon groups is just as bad as described by Nick there. Uh, first of thing, I think there are two things that we can assume, and, and I, I hate to even say it this way, but uh, I think it's the truth. First of all, we can assume that the federal government is not going to solve the problem. The second thing is that we can assume that as long as we have district school districts throughout this country ruling and overseeing the school system, we will never solve the problem. Now then, there is something that's on the horizon that I ran into the other day, by gosh, it gives me a lot of encouragement. I don't know how many of you read uh, the New York Times article that referred to Larry Klein's letter to CEOs. How many of you read that? I, I'm, I'm going to recommend very highly that you go to, to BlackRock Investment. I read it. And, 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 and Larry Klein is a chairman, founder, chairman, and CEO of it. And he sent a letter to everyone, uh, all the CEOs, that they invest in. Now, now his firm has a, a, um, an investment portfolio that approaches $2 trillion. So he has some leverage. And what he said in essence in that letter, and I'm not going to go through it in detail because it's fairly long, but what he in essence said that BlackRock is going to change its criteria for investing. And the criteria change is, is to get away from companies whose sole purpose is to make net income, to make profit. His sole purpose to make profit, they want to get away from investing in those companies. But to get into investing in companies who have uh, captured a social responsibility or recognize that they have a social responsibility to the, to the constituency that they serve. And that constituency is made up of the shareholder, the, the uh, customer, the employee, the uh, community, the vendor, and the government. Those are the, the, those are the, 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 the constituents that, that businesses who have a broad spectrum on what they should do, uh, uh, that's, that's who they look to to, to balance their uh, interest in those six, uh, location, six areas. The idea of the thing is this, is that if we can somehow or another influence, and there is a, a trend in this, businesses to take the, the tax benefit that we're going to give them, and instead of putting it in the pocket of people who already have more money and know what to do with, put it, in the, put it into social uh, endeavors that improve the community. There are a lot of them doing that now, uh, incidentally, uh, in, in terms of people like Bill Gates, uh, Google, uh, all of those, they, they are doing, the focusing on that. If you can get businesses in here to focus on that particular service, we can solve that problem. Every one of you in here are investors, and I would uh, recommend that you insist 
that ever who you invest with have a broad aspect and a broad strategy of who they serve, not just the stockholder. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nick, do you want to comment on that at all? I, I think it's a brilliant idea. I, I, no. what, what, what is your background, sir? What is your name and, and are you an educator or an investor or both? Well, I'm not an educator. I'm, I'm an investor, have been. Uh, I hate to say it right at the moment, but my whole career was spent in the General Electric Company. The what? The General Electric Company. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you and uh, Mr. Emhelt, huh? Yeah. Oh, please. <laughs> Peter? Uh, you tell such a compelling personal story that I apologize, I'm going to be asking a sociological question. I may, I may or may not have an answer for okay. you. <laughs> uh, among the immigrant groups in the United States, the Mexican community, and I think perhaps particularly in Southern California, stand out as being very slow to assimilate. If one uses, if one uses a measure of uh, formal education achievement and um, language preference uh, and also employment, but mainly people look at, uh, to measure assimilation, they look at um, formal education attainment. That the Mexican community, Mexican American community is the weakest of all the immigrant communities in the country. Um, do uh, do you feel that something, what are the factors, if this is true, what are the factors that are going on in Southern California that um, uh, are somehow retarding assimilation? I, I think uh, one of the things that people talk about, and I don't have a definitive answer for you, is proximity. They're not, they didn't come from Eastern Europe and to the United States. They didn't come from Ireland. They came from across the border. And, and so there, it's, it's, I think one of, the, one of the things why the people, why people say that the, the Spanish-speaking population, the Central Americans and the Mexicans um, don't, don't assimilate as quickly, say, as the Irish did or the Italians or whomever when they came over is because the, the, the Mexico is so proximate. It's, it's, it, and uh, yeah. Too close. Too close, yeah. And so, you know, and, there, and there's a lot of travel back and forth. A lot of travel, travel from, from California. I should tell you that the uh, gentleman who just asked that question, his name is Peter Rubinieri, he's from Woodstock. You want to say something about what you're doing on immigration, just uh, quickly? I, uh, um, up to yeah, I, I write a blog on immigration, and I do some writing for, uh, I've done some writing for the Valley News and do some writing for elsewhere. So I spend a fair amount of time thinking of these things. Now, mm. this actually leads into a related question, which is, um, the thought that uh, compared to any other immigrant group in the United States, we have what is essentially a circular, mi circular migration phenomenon in Mexico, Central America, and California, which has been confused and interrupted by border enforcement and by the stigmatization of illegal. But if we, if we somehow, somehow solve that, those, those conditions, that there will be a returning to Mexico, coming back and going forth, and that sort of thing. Do you think that, that, is, um, that th that's a vibrant amount of activity that could actually be more active if Im uh, immigrant status were, were more norm were normalized? Well, you're asking a question I don't really have the answer to. I, 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 I think it's a, complex, it's a complex issue. The, California's economy is, is, de is dependent on that, uh, that uh, particularly in the farming uh, communities, California's economy is dependent on having... I, my question this year has been really how much, how much went unpicked? How much went unplanted? This has has the, the what the, the new kind of attitude toward immig the immigrant population has that upset the the cycle because there weren't enough. I, I I don't know extensively about this, but I did read something that said that they, people were worried that there weren't enough people to to. Uh, yeah, the New York Times just had a piece about this uh, on Friday uh, on precisely the problem that it that that is being created. 
uh, because of the lack of a policy position on on DACA and whatnot, that the, the, there is a serious shortage of labor at a time when the when the American economy is growing. So, you know, and it, and it's also it's 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 a point that there are not other people willing to do those jobs. That's right. Yeah. Okay, Roger. <coughs> Job a little easier for you. I, I'm, I just want to um, sh shift just for one second, uh, Nick, just uh, uh, from a point of view. I'm, I'm kind of interested in your evolution as a novelist and also the subject you've taken on. Having read the book, I was I was uh, deeply moved by it, Thank you. and I was uh, very much um, drawn into the story. Um, I'm wondering, um, as an as a white Anglo uh, East Coast raised fellow who's been teaching in the schools, just and taking up this topic for a novel and putting yourself into the minds and hearts of of uh, young people who are quite separate from you, both in terms of age, obviously, and background and culture. Um, how much, um, in, in terms of your reconstructing their inner thoughts, their conversations, what's going on in their minds, their hopes, and so on, how do you how do you approach that as a novelist? Are you basing that you're basing it on clearly on your observations? But how much of these uh, young people opening up to you? How much of an insight do you actually have into their private lives and thoughts so that you? feel you can reconstruct this as a novelist accurately when you're representing it? You know, when you're a... Um, yeah. there's, lots of, there's lots of complexity to that question. When you, when you are a, a teacher, you know, I know you know, when you're a teacher who cares, and they know you can, you know, as a teacher, one of the things, I'm gonna go kind of around the, around the subject a little bit. Um, our students rarely remember what we taught them. They remember how we were with them. That's, uh, I, I think that's one of the early lessons I learned, that, they, that whether you respect them, whether you have a good sense of humor with them, whether you are clear in what you want from them, uh, all those things, I think, make the relationship a viable relationship. I mean, I, I, my daughter was taught by a brilliant mathematician who I fought with all year long. I said, you know, you're a wonderful mathematician. You can't teach her worth a shit. And I said, she is absolutely lost. She's a very good math student, and she shouldn't be failing your classes. This, this does not, but he was, a, he was. But he just didn't have the ability. Now, in that case, it was someone, not only did she not have any interaction with, but he just didn't somehow click with her, and she had to go elsewhere to, to do that. Uh, so I think that's, that's, that's a part of it, uh, the relationship that you establish. So my students were, uh, as I said, I, I was one of the few teachers who would open my classroom at lunchtime and, and just let them come in and said, you know, all you have to do is pick up your stuff and throw it away. And I, I you know, they, they could sit there and talk and, and you know, so I, I didn't really engage with them unless they engaged me. I was basically said, this is your time. To, if you want to, you know, be here, be here. And um, I think it's also, uh, yeah, I think it has so much to do with attitude. So I, I, I listened to them and would talk with them about, and they would, they would be, you know, the, the wonderful thing about children is that they will be utterly frank with you. And sometimes you go, oh my God, I, I don't think I really wanted to hear that. And, and you know, I, and I can't really, con you should go talk to the nurse about that. <laughs> Those kinds of things. Um, also, uh, I was very, I was drawn very close to my colleagues, and one of my colleagues, particularly, his name is Diego du uh, Diego Duarte. He was my student in eighth grade and in ninth grade, and his brother was my student, and his sister was my student. They all were taught, and I knew his mom. And mom would come to mom had very little Spanish, very little English, but she would come to the parent meetings, and she, religiously she'd be there, and uh, and uh, you know, and she didn't take anything from these kids. They they they, they towed the line by George, you know, and uh, 
So when it came time, I, when it came time for me to to write this and really kind of get into the inside of it, I went to Diego, and I said, you know, okay. So so you'll see, at the end of the book, um, there's a thing about candles, the grandmother with some candles, and he told me about that. I didn't know that, and about the importance of the rosary, the, the of her carrying her rosary. He he was very clear in helping me. He kind of said, this is what my this is what my aunt does. This is what my mom does. This is what, and um, you know, so he was very, very frank and very open, and I think it also had to do with my attitude toward. I, I really wanted to know. It wasn't just curiosity on my part. I really wanted to know, and um, I, I, I reference another person there, uh, another couple of people, Hector Ramirez and Blanca Guzman, who, who also were, you know, would say, no, that's not how they say it. They'd say it this way, and then, and this is the words they use. And again, I, you know, there's still some that I, you know, I, I know that there is slang that I didn't get right. You know that just they probably would have said something slangy that I didn't say slangy, and and uh, so you know there's, again I, I got to a certain depth, but didn't you know couldn't you know I, I wouldn't you know I'm not uh, I'm not uh, Luis uh, Luis Rodriguez the the man I quoted at the beginning of the book he's a wonderful writer it's a wonderful book called Always Running about his life in East LA gangs, and um, you know I'm not him you know he's got that inside track he really has the real knowledge of of what's going on. I don't know, did I answer your question in any kind of way? <laughs> Anyone else? Joe? In, in the schools that you taught in, what percentage of the teachers were not were Latino? Uh, well, that changed as when I first went there, um, when I first went to Sun Valley, as I said, it was going through a chain turnover. Uh, I, uh, actually, at one point, uh, um, a, a guy came on came on campus, and he was he was doing this. He was kind of, oh my God! He was a, a, a white man, and he had attended the school ten years before, and so he and I got talking, and and that's where that information came from. He said. All of us here, if you look back at the yearbooks from the 1970s, everybody here was white. <laughs> and they all came from locals. The, the, the Sun Valley is kind of ranch land. Uh, parts of it are uh, ranch land and horse land, and, 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 and people have horses and that kind of stuff. And then, and then there's the kind of the not that part. And um, so the, when I started teaching, all the white males kind of dominated the, the teaching staff. And then over the period of time, uh, I think it was a recognition on the part of the people who, uh, the principal and the others who interviewed for those positions, they, they brought in more Latinos, more people who were, you know, Spanish speaking. And so by the time I left Sun Valley 18 years later, there was a good, strong uh, Latino population of teachers. There were, there were good, oh God, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I had never thought about that. Yeah, but it, it, it was it was a much better balance, and uh, yeah. And I, do you uh, suppose that those uh, white people are Trump supporters? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know whether they would be or not. You know, these are farm. They, these are ranchers, and uh, I, you know, they're they're. I, I, you know, the tendency would be to say yes, but I, but I, I, I don't know. They were thoughtful people as well. Uh, seemed to me, anyway. No, I mean, they weren't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Julian. Uh, well, one of the things that you, the passage you read does very well, and really that your whole book does, is paint this picture of the dead end nature of, that these children live in and, and the cycle of despair and self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. And yet you tell stories of Ra like Raoul's of, of success and es escaping really from that. And I wonder to what factors can you point to in Raoul's life? You mentioned his perseverance. What other factors allowed him to escape? And do you see that as an opportunity for our educational systems in areas like, like that one, for those cases to be highlighted, to be championed, to be used as examples, to try to encourage and break that cycle. Maybe it's being done, but. I think it is. I think it, I think it is being done. You know, the people like, uh, I, Raul was lucky, he had a good mother. You know, she was dedicated, you know, and she was, 
Huh? Speak up a little more. Oh, okay. In the back, can't hear you. You, you okay? Can you hear me back there or not? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, he was he was very lucky. Raul, uh, the, the question was about Raul and why was he successful? He was successful, I think, because of his mother. I think she was devoted to him. She was a good mother, and I, I, I don't know if you know about <laughs> Latina mothers. If they don't behave, off comes the chancla. And have you seen that? Yeah, that, the slipper, the mom takes the slipper off, it's time to duck and run. <clears throat> and, uh, and, so, you know, and, and because there are so many single family, uh, single parent families, the, the, the mom has to take a strong hand. And, uh, and Raul was towered over her. He was a big boy. And mom was here. Yeah, they didn't mess around with mom, and, and that's true of the you know many of the uh, many of the Latino families. If there's a strong mother, and, and oftentimes there is, the, the, it, it's the mother who is. It seemed to me in my career, if the mother was strong, the kids are going to be okay. If the mother wasn't strong, then they weren't they weren't going to be okay, regardless of whether the father was in the house or the father wasn't in the house. Now that's a t terrible generalization, but it seemed to me it to ring to ring true. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's some of his success also is attributable to the fact that he found me. I mean, that, that, was, that was important that he, that he went looking and he found someone to help him out to pass the, the high school exit exam. But he had the, he had the will to do that. <clears throat> so it's kind of a, you know, a, a, it's kind of a two or three way street and it's kind of everybody has to play a hand. And I think the problem is that the problem that, 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 that occurs is that the parents are so busy working that there's not time for upbringing. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it's tough. It's, uh, and then you have this, this case like Edris, you know, who and for no fault of his own has to drop out of school to work because they can't make enough money. Mom is uneducated and he's basically uneducated. He doesn't have any education. He has a little bit of high school. That's it, and not much. And uh, so, who knows what's going to happen to him? And I, you know, I hate to think that he'll be one of those people that he'll become this. He'll be scapegoated. Well, see, he's a high school dropout. Well, he's a high school dropout for a reason. He has to be. He not, he's not. He's not going to have much choice. Yes. I'm sorry. Where, where do the dads go? What's the reason for so many single parent households? Stress. I'm pretty sure, just stress. Um, are they having to go to other places so that they can work? I don't know, I honestly don't know. I don't know where they go. They just, they just, they just disappear. They, they um, I, and oftentimes the family doesn't know where they've gone. You'll see in the book, the father disappears. The family doesn't know where he's gone. They have no idea where he's gone and, and until the end, and they know where he's gone. Um, I don't know. I don't know where the, you know, why, how, uh, that's a dynamic I don't understand. I don't, I don't you know, I'm, I'm sure it's multifaceted, and I don't, I don't really have any kind of real, I, I can tell you, you know, histories of, of families where the, the father, like, like Diego, the fellow who helped me write, you know, with the, with the language and the, and the situations in this, his mother and father were, were divorced, but the father was still, a, was still there. He was still kind of around. And he'd come for, they, they invited me uh, for Christmas Eve one time. And, and uh, the father and the uncles, his brothers, all showed up. They all went and played cards in the garage. They didn't interact with anybody, but they, but they all showed up at the mother's house with, you know, and so, you know, it's a, that's a dynamic I, I didn't truly understand. I witnessed it, but I didn't truly understand it. I didn't understand what, you know, and so. And then Blanca, who also helped me, uh, her mom was on her own. I don't know where the father had gone in that case. Maybe with another woman, maybe back to Mexico, maybe he broke the law, maybe he had to run back into Mexico and stay there. I don't know, yeah. Peter, do you have any theories about that? No, but I listened when you said stress. Mm -hmm. just, to, just to stress on the family to fragment it. Well, the same phenomena is in uh, very poor uh, uh, African-American uh, uh, neighborhoods as well. I mean, the whole problem of the missing African-American uh, father, father yeah. is, is, is a common. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, go. Go. Go ahead. So uh, my comment is um, that leaves the lack of a male role model for right. these young men. Right. It does. Uh, and in, as Tom just pointed out, in African American families and in Latino birth families. families. Yeah. yeah. I mean, poverty is, poverty is a multi, multifaceted thing. I mean, poverty is not just lack of money. Poverty is lack of resources, it's lack of guidance, it's lack of health care, it's lack of, you know, it's, 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 it's all kinds of things that, you know, deprivation. You know, when I, I, I couldn't, okay, so I, had, I, went, I went to boarding schools. I went to boarding school in sixth grade in upper northwestern Connecticut. And then I went, to, I went to a prep school in Connecticut, about a mile down the street from the boarding school I went to. I had never been in a middle school classroom, or a junior high school classroom started with. I didn't really know what, what, what to expect. And, and uh, yeah, so um, I, I came into that situation completely naive about what, you know, what to expect and what not, and, and uh, what was going to occur. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I uh, work for a construction company traveling around the country and was uh, directly involved in utilizing uh, immigrant labor like that in uh, outside of Dallas, Texas, and Houston, and also we were in L.A., as I told you before. You need to hold the microphone. Please. And uh, these, these men may be living in hotel rooms or a trailer park, and you go and you tell them, I need two, three, four, whatever you need. We're paying X. We need guys for two or three weeks. They huddle up and you drive away with however many guys you need. This goes on all over the country and people don't see it firsthand. Uh, they could be, these could be some of these guys because they're providing for their families remotely is what I would um, what I saw. Very interesting. Well, that's a, you know, the, the one of the concerns about the TPS, uh, about the about the, El, the the Salvadorans who are going to be returned to El Salvador. There's a couple of things to be worried about there. One is that the people, the Salvadorans in this country, provide so much money to El Salvador, and El Salvador is an extremely poor country. That's one of the things. The the the, the the, the Salvadorans who are in this country are sending money home and supporting, uh, and it's quite a, quite a bit of money. I think it's, you know, in, in the billions. Um, the other problem is, you know, that uh, I, I don't know if you've uh, seen the, the New Yorker article in the, the um, January 1st edition of the New Yorker, with the one with the elephant on the, on the big elephant on the front. They talk about the, 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 the Salvadoran gang, uh, Salva, uh, uh, Salvatruce, Mara Salvatruce, MS-13, which is, uh, we have done something probably to disrupt the, the, uh, the fabric of society in, in El Salvador because we have shipped back uh, all these guys who are part of MS-13, we've shipped them back to El Salvador. They're causing all kinds of hell there, and uh, and uh, because we wanted them deported out of this country because it's a very violent gang, and so uh, you know the combination of taking away the supply of money that the that the immigrant population in this country is providing for El Salvador, plus shipping back all these criminals back to El Salvador has disrupted that society terribly, and will and will do much worse damage, I think. There's another uh, model, uh, local, that I always found interesting. I don't know how widespread it is, but in uh, Newbury, um, Newbury is the town north of Bradford, uh, Vermont, uh, there is a Four Corners farm, and it's owned by Bill Gray and his wife. And for many, many years, they have been uh, hiring um, workers from Mexico. And they've established a very, very close relationship with the community that these workers come from. And they go there uh, in the winter and they come back and they've been doing this for 25 years. And they've helped uh, these workers uh, get their green card and they become members of that community. I mean, it's an amazing story. 
uh, of what one small uh, enterprise has managed to do uh, with benefits for, for both sides. Okay, you're going to tell us about the schools you're starting with all the money you made? <laughs> Okay, keep it short. Because we have to go to dinner. <laughs> well, I thought, I thought this went to 6.30. It, it, it can go as long as you like. Yeah, but other people have to talk, not you. <laughs> uh, I have just one other comment in here, and I'm not knowledgeable in the area. Um, but it seems like to me that there is some degree of lack of imagination in the teaching profession itself <laughs> as to how you get get students interested in learning how to learn or wanting to learn. Uh, things like, uh, like the Khan Academy uh, method of teaching, uh, the use of, of uh, the devices that we have here like smartphones and iPads and things of that nature, where instead of trying to teach them the subject, you teach them the ability to find out about that particular subject. Uh, I'd like to see really more imagination, I think, in a part of our teaching profession and looking at some of these things that may be more beneficial than what we've been doing. I'm going to respond to that, if I may, <laughs> having spent my life as a, as a teacher. Uh, the microphone. Uh, not in any way, Is that short enough? He can be, he can be brief. My brother, who really was in a kind of crucible where I've never been. I've had the privilege of I mean, talk, but I, I think my voice carries. Is it not? So I've had, uh, can you hear me better this way? Yeah. yeah. I, I've had the privilege of uh, teaching at Dartmouth College for off and on for more than 50 years. And it has been an enormous privilege to me. But I've learned a lot, uh, not only from my own experience as a classroom teacher, but from also associating with other teachers, prominent teachers and professional associations. And I assure you, sir, that while I have no, no uh, reluctance whatsoever to admit to the utility of technological means in the classroom and for learning, there is no substitute for interaction between human beings. That the best teaching material is the best teacher with an interested student. So I, I remain committed to that. Uh, I think that is the, the very heart of liberal learning uh, at a place like Dartmouth College, uh, where it should, in some cases, I think, be more central than it is currently. But uh, I really do think that there should be some hesitation before we uh, go overboard in thinking that somehow, if every kid has a computer in the classroom, um, that uh, the learning will be better. It will be different, and in some areas it will be enhanced. But I will, to my dying breath, insist upon uh, the interaction of a kind of Socratic model. I see that that would be my model of a person, a, a teacher, an instructor, a collaborator working with interested students. There's, there's so much to say about this as a topic. Oh, I don't need this. I got this thing connected to me. Here you go. Uh, one, uh, you, the real teaching, no matter whatever happens, no matter how big the classroom is, the real teaching is one-on-one. -on -one. It's, it's me and you, and that's it. And it can be all these other people, but it's, 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 it happens between the two of us. And when, when, that, it, it ha and when you're in a classroom and you feel as though the teacher understands that you're there and you're in his, in, values you, then I think that's where real teaching happens. And that, that's that. Yep. Uh, okay, there, there is that. And, and one of the reasons, I, I don't know whether you followed a couple of years ago when Los Angeles bought iPads for all of its students. Actually, we lost a superintendent because of this faux pas. They bought a whole bunch of uh, uh, iPads for the kids. They spent a fortune on iPads. And they said, we have made it so they cannot get in and mess, and mess with these things. They can't get in and get past the firewall. They'll never do it. In 20 minutes, 
<laughs> in 20 minutes, it took exactly something, one kid, 20 minutes to get into those, and that was it. So they couldn't control that they, they, the sites that the kids went to. They, they got into sites they read, they guaranteed, the, the administrators guaranteed the kids couldn't get into. And so um, that proved to be a, a, a phenomenal waste of money. And, and so the way I handled uh, le uh, electronics in the classroom was this. I'd say, I, I, w I don't want to take them from you. I, I don't want your damn cell phone. What I do want you to do is put it on silent mode for now. And just you know, everybody give a chance to put that on silent mode. And I said, okay, there's going to come a time during the classroom where I want you to take it out and use it, but it's not right now. And then when we, you know, and I would try to build into the lessons that I taught, knowing that they were dying to see who had contacted them on Facebook. I knew they, were, I knew they needed to do that. That's that's part of the the reality of our, our day. But also, I had I had a real task for them to to perform as well. And so I, I it worked most of the time. It, it wasn't universally successful, but it worked most of the time. Here's the last thing I would say about all of this. For, not the last thing, two last things. One is teachers are phenomenally underpaid. In North Carolina, where I currently live, the teacher salary is $40,000 a year. Uh. You're talking about an experienced teacher, $40,000 a year. I, obviously, North Carolina is less expensive than Los Angeles, but it's not that, that less expensive. And so you have people who are basically somewhat educated to be in the classroom. They do have a BA or a BS. Uh, they may have something more than that, but they're not paid much for it, and they're not paid much to, to encourage them to go beyond that. The last thing I would say about, and I, that I bring this from Los Angeles, there are a lot of unfunded mandates for teachers. You have to do this, particularly in regards to special education and including the kids who are identified as challenged, educationally challenged. They have to be included in the classroom. They have to be now, they cannot have separate classrooms. They are more and more, they talk more and more about inclusion. And so you have, and you may have, you may have an aid in the classroom, but you may not. And so the demands on teaching get to be more and more, and the, and, and the support, not as much. And so it becomes a matter of, you know, there's just people like you and me who are teachers. And you know, you get to the point, you say, I'm tired. And I, you know, I'm not getting much for what I'm doing here. And so you really have to call on reserves that maybe, you know, that, 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 that others don't have to call on to be able to be successful in the classroom. You know, and so there's a lot of things mitigating against being, you know, uh, uh, toward, toward changing the way we do things. It may, it may take people out of the classroom to bring it to the classroom. And people who have been you know, thoughtful about this and and make it work for the classroom. It's very difficult. Yes, sir. I just want to say to the gentleman at the other end of this aisle, I taught in a local school for 25 years, had 3,000 students, and I was flattered to hear you say that we're all investors here. I never had enough money to invest in anything. <laughs> When I left, I was at the top of the pay scale at $63,000. When I came in, I started with three master's degrees at $26,000. Wow. So I'd like to validate what you just said about teachers being underpaid. I'd also like to say, you, you made whoever said it before that. is dead right. We think we're teaching a curriculum. What the students are studying is the adult in front of them and whether the adult is fair and the kind of world they create in that little room for 90 days. That's what they're studying. I also want to say I made a deal with my students. I retired in 2012. If you give me 40 minutes of work, I'll give you 10 minutes with your cell phone to do anything you want. <laughs> and it worked like a charm. <laughs> Well, listen, thank you all for coming. It was really, really glad. And thank you, Nick. <laughs>